Time to take a look at the heart here on the Exam Room Podcast, brought to you by the Physicians Committee. Hi, I am the weight loss champion, Chuck Carroll. Today, we are so lucky to be joined by a phenomenal cardiologist and a friend of the show. With that, we welcome Dr. Columbus Batiste to the show, co-founder of Healthy Heart Nation. My man, thank you so very much for taking the time. Yes, good to see you. Good to see you. Always a pleasure being here. The pleasure is all mine, man. With it being Heart Health Month, I wanted to take some time here to talk about the heart. You know, we we talked a little bit about that last month with Dr. Barnard or Dr. Steve Loam. Matter of fact, it was Dr. Mm-hmm. Steve Loam. And I said to him, Dr. Loam, how many of these heart disease cases are actually preventable? And he estimated nothing short of 80 some odd percent. And when I think about heart disease then being the leading cause of death, here in the United States, if we can eliminate 80% of those cases, basically, Dr. Batiste, you'd be out of a job, you know? Yes, yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. I mean, I think the key is for us to be able to focus on those life threatening, those emergency situations, those infectious disease situations, which even down that road, studies have begun to tell us that our lifestyle and nutrition plays a role in our body's ability to mount a response. I mean, see, one of the key things that we've lost in this thing called medicine, the practice of medicines, we've lost the power of the things that, as they say, everything that every not everything that counts can be counted and not everything that counts uh, uh, that can be counted counts. And so what does that mean? In medicine, we're so specific and reductionist. We're looking at the active ingredient. We're looking at something cause and effect. And that's all we hold as true. But we understand that life is much more complex. Much is, it's much more complex. And so as we begin to look at our role in the environment, our communities we live in, the foods we eat, how those foods are sourced, right? That then has a role in the environment and animal welfare, how the government plays a role in all that stuff that then disseminates down to our health. We're interconnected. Our decisions are not done in isolation. No man is an island and neither is our health. And so that's why it's so important. And when we look at this, this idea and this concept of reducing the burden of cardiovascular disease, it's greater than we could even imagine. It's greater than placing stents and prescribing pills. It's greater than just saying solely, to be honest with you, just eat better. That's a core component, but it's bigger than that. It really truly is. So let's talk uh, some of those numbers. Let's quantify this. Uh, 87% of premature deaths due to non-communicable diseases occur in low to middle income countries. And I look at who really is being disproportionately affected by cardiovascular disease here in this country, and it would also be people who are living in low-income areas. No question about that. If you're living in a low-income area and you're in what is known as a food desert or a food swamp, access to healthy food is really kind of at a premium. Matter of fact, there was a study that was just released showing that if you live in a low income area, okay, you have a 13% higher risk of suffering a stroke than somebody who has greater access to high quality food. Mm -hmm. What can we do if you are living in that area? What can you possibly do to kind of reverse that unhealthy trend and make sure that you're getting the adequate nutrition that you need? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, first thing is understand is that we have to break the shackles. Right. So we almost seem it's seemingly as if we're constricted. We're inside these crucibles of conflict in these neighborhoods that are riddled with crime, that are riddled with smog and pollution, that are riddled with lack of access for fresh walkways and things of that nature of noise pollution. They're riddled as well with all of these food swamps, which means overconsumption of highly processed refined foods. And they're all around you. It bombards you with TV ads. And we're about to hit that when Super Bowl comes around the corner, right? If we're not already here, is that we see it all the time. These ads that get your mouth salivating. You think about those old things and it begins to play tricks on our mind. And then we live in these environments where now the food is discounted. And that's why we call it food swamps. An overabundance of of calorie dense, nutrient poor foods. And we see it inside of, of many of the quick serve restaurants so much. So this is the study you mentioned is, a, is an unfortunate study, but really it shines a light on information we know already. 
Some of these studies out there have shown for years, years ago, showed that just having a fast food uh, uh, meal once a week increases your risk of heart disease by 20%. Those who undertake eating this four to five times a week increase their risk by 80%. So what can we do? Listen, it's not your destiny. Guess what you can do? You're going to make convenience work for you. I'll tell you, Chuck, one of the things I did when I was doing my cooking class called Cooking Alternative to Health, and it called the cath lab. That's where we also go to kind of stop a heart attack in its tracks. What we would do is we'd have the no cooking cooking class. You scratch your head and say, well, well come on, what does that mean? Yeah, right. A no, a no cooking cooking class means that we're going to the grocery stores and we're getting frozen vegetables without the butter and the sauces on it. We're getting rice that, hey, I don't have time to cook it. Okay, I'm going to buy frozen or boiling it in the bag rice. I'm going to buy actually canned beans with low salt and or no salt and BPA free. I'm going to get pico de gallo. I'm going to make all these things. And guess what I'm going to make? I'm going to make a bowl. And I'm going to have a healthy meal that I can get at my mass uh, uh, chain store that's there, that's available in most uh, disparate communities still, that you can still go in and buy frozen foods and combine them with the use of a microwave only and heat them up. You can wrap it in a burrito shell. You can do the same thing with, with, with spaghetti. You can do the same thing with potatoes, right? Mm. And so there is a way in which you can eat conveniently and cost-effectively even in disparate communities and still retain the flavor and taste that you're used to. Well, number one, that bowl sounds pretty daggone good. Uh, <laughs> number two, I, I hopped on uh, the website for the grocery store Ralph's before this interview. And I was like, okay, well, let's do a cost comparison because I was assuming the conversation might go in this direction. Right now with the Super Bowl coming up, you can get a party size big bag of Lay's potato chips, 13 ounces for $2.99. You think, well, that's pretty cheap, right? Of course, you're going to go for the cheapest foods when that's what your finances allow for. But you think, well, eating healthy, you know, it, it, it can't happen on a budget. It, you just can't do it. But as you just said, well, frozen foods are pretty good. But then even with the fresh produce, you can get a five pound bag of potatoes for that same $2.99. Cook those in the microwave as well. No problem. You can get 16 ounces of baby carrots if you want that crunch for a dollar forty nine. And then, oh, by the way, a you mentioned rice as well, a five pound bag of rice. Now, this will require some cooking. But if you just get a pot, you boil mm -hmm. it with some water, the rice five pound bag, three seventy nine. And that three seventy nine will get you no less than 50 servings of rice. Love that it. goes a Love long it. way. Absolutely. And, you know, I mean, and, and here's the thing. If you're like, well, I don't want to eat potato during Super Bowl. Here's the thing. You can slice those potatoes up. You can go ahead and put them in. You can go ahead and, and mash them in there. And now guess what you have? You have these appetizers that are phenomenal that you'll add just simply some spices to it and you can transform. And so we just it takes effort. It takes a little bit of thought and imagination, but it actually does not take a lot of time to really get these things going. And that's where the, the importance is inside of all of this. Now, let's look at some numbers here. Um, I think, it, to be perfectly honest with you, a lot of times, Dr. Batiste, when we bring race into the conversation here on the exam room, there are you know people who will email and they're like, I just, I, I, I'm so tired of hearing about this. And so I want to take another tact with this to try to really open some more people's eyes. One of the conversations that I've had previously is with Dr. Kim Williams, who will also be at the help conference. And his, his theme essentially was like, look, you know, it does not have to do with race. Like it's, it's, you know, because you're black, your genetics, uh, you know, don't say put you at any higher risk for certain diseases than mine do as a white individual, but it comes down to socioeconomics. And so here's what I'd like to point out. Growing up, Dr. Batiste, I didn't have a lot. I mean, nothing. Utilities always being turned off, single mom, you know, fast food, just because that's what she could afford. That's the time that we had. If not, it was junk food in the cupboard. And it ballooned me all the way up to eventually 420 pounds. And you know, as I was able to grow in my career, my appetite also grew, but my eating habits did not. They were ingrained in me at such a young age. And so I think about being 420 pound me 
in that kind of financial jackpot, you know, I would think then that my risk for all of these diseases that are completely preventable in a lot of cases would have been far greater than it is today. Wouldn't you say? Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and, you know, so what you're espousing, you're, you're talking about is really our environment. And one of the things we know whenever individuals talk about race and it's the tired discussions, what many people say is that we understand race is a, a fictional construct. It's a social construct. It's, it has false scientific uh, basis really as it relates to, because we all know that genetically we're very similar. We're extremely similar to the 99th degree. We're similar. We're the same. And so this idea of race is a social construct. Now let's dig into that as a social construct, because you brought this out is that when we look at the social environment that an individual lives in, oftentimes it's impacted by your financial ability of where, where you're at on this caste system of finances, earnings, which then dictate, which may play a role in education, which plays a role in the air environment in which you live, the housing, the neighborhood, the pollution, the way in which things are done from that perspective. You look at the types of foods that are available. Now you look at the role of the reliance potentially on government subsidies, which then direct you potentially a, uh, 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 one pathway. That it takes a concerted effort to really redirect and now we're not even speaking about levels of bias that may presumptions that come in, right? So whether or not when you are chucking, so I'm curious, I'm gonna turn the tables and I'm gonna interview you. <laughs> have you noticed, did you ever notice a difference or have you noticed a difference when you were 400, 300 pounds compared to you right now in the way in which people interacted with you, the way in which they wanted to help you in the store, their perception of your ability to, of your lazy, of saying that you're lazy or, or your ability to uh, uh, aspire towards greatness. Was there a difference in the bias that you observed uh, between one weight and the other? Uh, enormously so. Um, you, it, it, it wasn't just in the grocery store. It was in every store. I mean, I remember one time going through the drive through at Taco Bell and even they told me that I was eating too much food. Like this is somebody who's paying your salary, <laughs> yet you feel emboldened enough to tell the customer basically to like shame them, right? Like the audacity of somebody to do that or just to be walking down the street and have somebody yell, Hey, fat ass, mm. you've never seen this person before in your life. And, 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 and you just kind of get stepped on day after day after day. And you always see these stares that people give you and they don't think that you can see them. You can. And so how does that make you, how'd that make you feel though? It how'd sucked, you man. Feel? And you know what I did? You know, I just went to another Taco Bell after that to keep getting my fix. Right. Yeah. And I nine times out of 10 would turn to food for emotional comfort, which is a different kind of a conversation. But it certainly didn't elevate my spirits in any kind of way. Well, see, and, and this is this is my point. Follow me. Right. That's horrible. That's unacceptable that someone in uh, had a bias against you, a presumption based on your appearance. Now, you were able to change your appearance, thankfully through nutrition, the power of lifestyle and able to change that. And now the interaction may be different. Now imagine for a moment living in a different skin mm. that you can't change by lifestyle. Mm -hmm. And the impact of that, that stress that's persistent, we live here in black, this is also Black History Month. So imagine, so when people talk about, I'm so tired of the race discussion, imagine that same situation you described but now never being able to escape it despite every single effort, despite achieving every level of success that the world views as success, becoming a, a, a CEO, becoming the president, becoming an actor, becoming a billionaire. But then yet and still in a moment's time, you can have a slur uh, thrown at you. You can still mm. have a stare. You can still have the presumption that you don't belong. And those things layer in stress. And we understand that stress builds a cascade of inflammation that then has a downward turn towards predictive of cardiovascular events, raising your risk for high blood pressure. And so, yes, we can mitigate this tremendously through nutrition to help offset. I, that's why I always love my the, the equation I came up with, a little self-promotion. Health <laughs> equals resiliency divided by stress. Health equals resiliency divided by stress. So the more, if I'm adding to my nutritional stress 
on top of the, the racial bias stress, on top of the financial stress, on top of the environmental stress, guess what's going to happen? My health is going to fail me exponentially. But yet, if I begin to move towards adding resiliency, I tap into that nutritional resiliency of fruits and vegetables and whole grains, beans, legumes, nuts, and seeds. I empower my body and enrich my body and arm it to fight. I'm emboldening my, my health. I'm helping to offset those stressors that it takes a concerted effort on our parts to do that. And that's that translates over to our community. We have to build resiliency. We have to help our community. The Health Equity Lifestyle Project is not just about color or creed. It's about all of us. Because when we begin to help our communities, we help ourselves. And when we help ourselves, now we're in a situation that we should and could and we can and we better help someone else. You know, and I hear you talk about that and I'm thinking like, OK, could it also be part of it is like if if you are living in that community and say, you know, if I were black and I were living in that community and I would have lost all the weight. All right. And I'm you know, I was able to change that part of my appearance. But still, if I were to look around and see a lot of other people who are still struggling with their health living in the same community that I am. I would start to feel also a little bit better about myself because I had just, you know, I would feel in some regards have beaten those odds and did something that I didn't think was possible. And, and I think that just feeling better about yourself is also going to do nothing but help you take further steps forward in other parts of your life so that you can improve your circumstances and thus turn around, as you said, and help others in the community as well. Could it just be as simple as feeling better about yourself really kind of being the catalyst for all of this? Absolutely. That that power of, well, first, I'm, I'm going to take a step back. I think that there is something, in, and I'm not an expert with this, and I had a guest on a little show I did and named Dr. Allie, and she brought up, and that she's not the first to originate this, but the power of self-acceptance. I'm accepting myself. It doesn't mean I'm perfect. It doesn't mean I like my size, but I accept myself, right? And so I think that starts there. But once you begin the process of change and you recognize that I can empower myself, you're absolutely right that that resiliency and that sense of accomplishment, the keystone habits that begin to build as you accomplish things, that now allows it to dovetail into the community is powerful. But here's the crazy part. So we've all heard of Blue Zones. Right? The most long, long lived individuals around the world. And, and the fact that when we look at the Venn diagram, that overlapping of some of the things, we understand that there's a sense of purpose. Uh, there's a sense of belonging. We understand that there is a sense of identity, of community that's there. And so they have replicated some of that work has been done down inside of Atlanta, looking at communities of color and communities of despair where there should be a heightened risk of cardiovascular events. And what they've demonstrated is that in those communities that have a sense of identity, that have a sense of belonging, that just what you're saying, that as the domino effect begins, that you can still stave off cardiovascular disease. And so once again, that resiliency helps offset the stress from perhaps racism or, or classism or caste system. And now you're able to embolden your health and build your community. And that's where the power lies. And that's what we want to try to convey is that there is hope. Yes, nutritionally, there's hope in which you can transform your body, which then, like you said, will help you mentally and physically. And then that allows you to, to do more. Yeah, I, I just you, you got to make number one, number one. You know, yeah. and, 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 and that's how you're able to help other people. You know, I, I see even my wife struggle with this. She's so busy taking care of her mom and her dad right now that she really, you know, has fallen into a pattern. I love her to death, not speaking out of school, but she, I kind of neglecting her own health. And mm. I, I keep telling her, I'm like, baby, I love you so much. I'm worried about you. I need for you to take some time to you know, just focus on yourself so that you can then give your mom, your dad the best possible care that you absolutely can. Let me take this load off of your shoulders for a little bit so that you can just focus on you. And she really wrestles with that, you know, because it's her mom and her dad. You know, you, you just want to have that energizer bunny mentality to keep going and going and going and going. But eventually that battery's going to run out of juice, man. What would you tell somebody who's kind of in that position as a physician? Oh, wow. One, I'll tell you, in all honesty, one is 
I think that speaks volumes of her parents and what they did in raising her. Oh, yeah. The fact of her love and her commitment towards them. And I think that's powerful. That that power of family is so important and that love. And so I think love is a major issue that's there that drives us and we have to have. And that love during Heart Health Month is so important. We talk about oxytocin, that bonding. We talk about the power of forgiveness, the power of volunteering. But you have to have the volunteer. You have to love yourself. And just what you're saying, Chuck, that's what I would tell any of my patients and I have told them is you have to make time for you. I'm not going to use the old adage of put the, the mask on yourself first or any of that stuff. I'm going to get practical. I want you to schedule the least amount of time possible that you know you can achieve. Can it be 15 minutes that you can give just for you? And I'll ask patients, tell me the last time you laughed about something. Tell me what's the last thing that you laughed about. Tell me when's the last time you did something for you that did not affect anyone else was completely selfish. Went for a walk, went down to the mall, went and sat and watched a movie. I want you to do those sorts of things just for you to build, once again, that mental energy. We have to recharge. We, we, we put off laughing. When I'm sitting there reading studies, Chuck, when I'm on call, guess what I'm doing? I'm watching some whatever my favorite sitcom is. And I'm <laughs> laughing while I'm reading images and, and everything else like that. People next door are probably thinking, this dude is crazy. <laughs> <laughs> but I'll tell you, it's powerful. The yeah. power of laughter is huge. I sleep. I tell everyone, 15 minutes. Go, 15, go a bit 15 minutes earlier. We were talking about this earlier. Right. Some people are, are they like to stay up late. Other people, they like to go a bit earlier, but we need at least that seven hours of sleep. Why it helps build our mental fortitude, it helps uh, stave off Alzheimer's. It helps all these things, our ghrelin, our, our leptin, our hormones and so forth, that the intimacy of relationships for your wife. I tell her when you know, you have to make sure you have a date night with Chuck and you have to have a date night with yourself. Mm -hmm. Get away from Chuck. Go spend time just with you. I mean, <laughs> sorry, let's man. not go too sorry, far, man. man. Come sorry, on. Sorry, man. Come on. <laughs> <You know? laughs> she needs a little self. She needs some time just for her, whatever, whatever her thing is. If it's a massage, if it's just relaxation, meditation, whatever it may be. She has to do those sorts of things is yeah. what I would empower. There's 24 days, 24 hours in a day. She can, I would say, commit to give yourself at least an hour a day. Give yourself an hour a day. Give yourself a half hour a day. That's all. It doesn't sound like much in the grand scheme, but it adds up. It's additive. I, I love that. Um, in terms of heart health, though, like yeah. going for a walk versus just killing some brain cells and watching reality TV. Um, I, I'm sure that there is, you know, some benefit to just vegging out and letting everything just kind of fall by the wayside for an hour. But if somebody instead were to opt for going for that walk to clear their head, what kind of additional benefit are they getting there? Oh, man. So, I mean, there's so much power that we understand. First and foremost, we think that we're decompressing by sitting down watching our television show. And that allows us to remain in isolation. But studies tell us that isolation is like smoking 15 to 20 cigarettes a day. That loneliness is like that. That really, it does not mitigate or decrease that stress hormone cascade. But when we engage in either activity or social interaction, that oxytocin tend to befriend, we're actually staving off the effects of stress hormone cascade. That when we begin to walk, that what we're doing is we're strengthening our cardiovascular system. We're increasing our, 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 our functional capacity. We're decreasing blood pressure, but not only so that combination, just simply walking, right? And then when you take that inside of nature, and you do it inside of a green area if you have access to that. If you do it inside of the fresh air, that now you're getting that combination of vitamin D, which can help dilate the vessels and release some subcutaneous nitric oxide, right? That can help dilate the vessels and stave off cardiovascular events. We understand the power of the vitamin D in terms of for cancer prevention, in terms of the gastrointestinal tract. Uh, not so much the levels that's going to cause skin cancer. We don't want that kind of exposure. Uh, we understand the power of breathing fresh air a breath, a breathing, right? That That's powerful in this combination of effects of what happens when you get active, that all of a sudden you get mental clarity. I, I tell the story years ago, my daughter, um, when she was just entering puberty and so forth, she was grumpy. My daughter, my kids are, I've been blessed, right? They're not... They're not the movie version of teenagers at all. They've, they've been wonderful kids for me and, and <laughs> made, made life easy for me, right? Uh, and so I, and so, but she was grumpy. 
And, and so I was like, come on, let's go for a walk. I don't want to go for a walk today. I don't want to go for a walk. I said, come on, let's, we're going for a walk. So we're going for a walk and she's kind of pouting as she's walking down the road. And so I'm telling my jokes and talking to her and she's kind of ignoring me and we're going and probably about 15 minutes in, the arms start loosening up. They start bouncing and swinging there a little bit. And all of a sudden I see a smile on her face as I'm telling my little corny jokes, right? Next thing I know, she's laughing. And by the end, she's like, I do feel better, Daddy. I do feel better, right? And, and it's the power is because it's like, this is like our superhero juice, like Superman. We yeah, get out man. that sunlight and start moving. It energizes us. It reinvigorates us and it empowers us. And we need to take time to do it on a regular basis. Yeah. Father knows best, right? That I mean, that's that's Man. a great story, dude. I love that one. Um, I w let's let's wrap with this because this is a, a nutrition show primarily. Yes. And I think that there's a lot of people who are like, OK, now let's let's just get to the food. I We've got a lot of great practical tips. We've got a lot of great insight. Now let's get something that we can, you know, take and move forward uh, with our own lives starting today. So if somebody is living, you know, in poverty, don't have a lot of money. Yes. Let's go ahead and help them fill that shopping cart. What I'm going to do with you is I'm going to put you on the spot. I'm going to give you $40 right now. And you've got a family of four. $40 is what you have to put uh, toward groceries that particular day. What are you filling your shopping cart with? So for me, first thing I'm doing is I'm getting, um, like you mentioned, I'm getting a, a sack of potatoes, right? Typically, I'm probably going to be able to get out of that family of four. I'm at least getting several days worth for a minimal. You spoke already about roughly $2 and some odd cents for a sack of potatoes. I may get two of those, right? That gives me a full week's worth of work, excuse me, a worth of, of eating. I'm getting a, a, um, a pound of, of dry beans, too, as well. Why? Because those beans will extend a while. I can make chili with it. I can make burritos with it too as well. I'm now going in and I'm getting to as well. I'm getting mushrooms, right? That I'm going to add. I'm getting some onions that are there. I am getting, uh, um, uh, those are, are some of the primary staples. I'm going to get tortilla shells, you know, uh, that are there. And then I'm going to get some frozen vegetables that I will, I will add in um, to as well. Now, what will I do with that? My goal is I'll get some tomatoes and everything else. I'm not sure what the tabulation comes to. I'm, I'm do, going through the checkout line and she's in. she <laughs> says, I have 20 bucks more. Now I'm rolling up with spices, things that won't decay. So I'm getting everything that will sustain and have sh has shelf life. I'll get garlic. I'll get tomatoes, which I'll use for making my uh, chili. Now I'm going to make a chili that I can add on top of the a meatless chili with mushrooms and with tomatoes and with the beans that I can add on top of the potatoes and I have a hearty meal, I can roll into a shell and make burritos that are there too as well. I can eat by itself. So in that small amount of time, I've, I've made sustainable meals there from that standpoint. I can then go in and if I have money left over, now I'm getting um, tomato paste and I'm making a large pot of spaghetti, right? That now I can have frozen uh, vegetables with it or I can have noodles with it and kind of going down that road. And so now I'm kind of building a meal plan for the week if I have $40 for the week. And then that probably should about roughly take care of the $40. I probably have a little bit of change left over that I can, I can buy some fruit and make a nice little fruit compote. Yeah. That's not, that, that all sounds pretty good, man. Um, again, you're just on point. I'm going to be out in California. I'm coming over for dinner. That's the end of the story. <laughs> um, uh, so you, you bring up tomatoes. Uh, if somebody wants to have something that's, uh, has a little bit more of a shelf life than a fresh tomato, uh, canned tomatoes, are they okay in your book? Absolutely. Absolutely. So I always look for salt free, um, typically in wh whatever I, I purchase is what my goal is. And so I'm a big proponent and I'll tell you why is that? Because you have to get, you have to meet people where they're at. And I'll never forget this patient. I'm, I'm doing all my spill. This is kind of early on in my journey. I've been at this nutrition blend it with cardiac stuff for roughly about 12 years. And I'll tell you, I had a patient and, and I was, I'm giving my pitch. Oh yeah. I eat this, this, this. He said, doc, I have roaches in my, in my, in my apartment. We don't have access to anything. I can't leave stuff out. I don't really, my refrigerator is broken. And I remember flipping in that moment. And I said, we're going to get down and dirty. We're going to get, what kind of canned foods can we get? 
What kind of frozen foods can we get? What kind of things that are not going that we can prepare quickly in the in the microwave? I mentioned the no cooking cooking class. That was the birthplace for it. Mm. Oh, that was where the seeds were planted. Recognizing that, yeah, it's easy to talk to someone who has, they have the Instapot, no offense to Instapot. They have the, the Vitamix and they have the Blendtec. They have all these equipment, the immersion blender. They have all this stuff. They're like ready to roll their professional chef. Okay, I'm not preaching to the choir. I'm not preaching to those who are A students already. I'm preaching to those people who are C and D students who need to be uplifted to get to another level because that's what we're 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 here for. And so that's where the, that's that's the goal and that's where the night is for everything kind of started with me with this. And my final question to you is this, you take the potatoes, you take the pasta, everything that you're doing there making burrito bowls, the chili. How does that compare in terms of heart health versus what is, you know, so prevalent in these food swamps, the chips? the fast food, the junk food, all of that. What does that do for your cardiovascular risk when you focus on the menu that you just prescribed? Well, I mean, I think the says kind of speak for themselves. We've just came out of the, the, the veterans millions uh, 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 veteran study that kind of showed that anyone, irrespective of, of race, because we understand race is a social construct, that when you move from eating any and everything towards a plant-based diet, your risk and burden in occurrence of diabetes, heart disease, stroke, heart failure diminishes exponentially, very consistent with Adventist Health Study that also demonstrate the same sort of scenario. We've seen it time and time again as we begin to move towards eating more plant-rich foods. The REGARDS trial told us that in individuals of color, that when looking and seeing what is the risk burden, that when you move away from the organ meats, the sugar sweetened beverages, over towards more plant rich foods, you decrease that burden and risk for sudden cardiac death. You decrease the burden and risk for dialysis, for sepsis, for heart disease. The key is, the enemy is, I'm gonna tell you, especially to our audience out here, right? So I'm gonna say our audience because I feel we're family, Chuck. Right? Absolutely, man. <laughs> Absolutely. So, so we're family. And so many of our audience, they say, I'm vegan. They love terms like I'm vegan. Uh, I'm a flexitarian. I'm vegetarian or I'm plant-based. The key is what's the quality of food that you're eating? Because many times we're just standard American diet, some other type of iteration, standard American diet, vegan style. And we're having chips and we're having cookies and the enemy, the common thread enemy that we all need to fight against is salt, sugar, and fat. Right. Salt, sugar and animal protein, excuse me, is probably a more appropriate terminology that's there. And when we look at this, this confluence, this evil trinity, that's what mitigates disease and really inflames the process there that we have to kind of we, we really need to offset. That's the power. You know, I, I was talking with Kim Williams actually just last night. And I'm not ashamed to mention it. I learned every single moment I learned from you, Chuck. You shared something with me I was unaware of. And he shared a study about 30 minutes. <clears throat> after drinking a sugar sweetened beverage and i haven't had time between last night at nine o'clock and this morning to look up the study but 30 minutes your c reactive protein increases within 30 minutes of ingesting a sugar this is what the the detrimental effect of sugar can have on our bodies mm -hmm. and so what is c reactive protein a marker of inflammation a predictive uh agent of cardiovascular events and that's why what we eat is so important. That's why these communities at risk, these food swamps and food deserts have such a high burden of disease that leads to mental health issues that lead to, um, to other common chronic disease states as well. Dr. Batiste, family man, welcome to the fam. You are always welcome to come yes. here, man. It's always such a treat and a pleasure and an honor to talk to you. Thanks for making the time. Appreciate you in this month of love. Love you, man. Appreciate you. If your health IQ was a couple of points higher than it was a few minutes ago, go ahead and like this video or subscribe to the YouTube channel. And to take it even higher, head over to Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your favorite shows. Look for the exam room by the Physicians Committee. Hit the subscribe button there as well and help to make your world a healthier place.